there gang, welcome back. Let's dig ourselves into a Gibson today. This is the ever popular Hummingbird model. It's really the sound of the 1960s. A lot of recordings have one of these chugging along in the background. Um, most any acoustic Rolling Stones song you can think of has one of these on it. My first experience with a Hummingbird came when I was about 9 or 10 because my fifth grade teacher used to bring one in for a music class and it was a really striking guitar to look at. You know, I dug that red sunburst effect. Gibson first came out with this model in 1960. It didn't actually show up in the catalog for a few years after that though, until 1962, but they'd already been selling them. And it was kind of a stylistic departure uh, for Gibson. It has those square shoulders that look like a Martin Dreadnought. It's uncharacteristic for the company. And all this engraved pick garden stuff, that looks a lot like what they've been doing over on the Epiphone half of the plant for a few years since they bought that company out. Uh, they've really been pushing the Western motifs in the Epiphone line, and I guess they decided to slide some of that over into the Gibsons. So this really becomes the linchpin in their acoustic lineup. They're often mahogany bodies, sometimes laminate, sometimes not. In 1962 and 63, there were a limited run of laminated maple, like this one here. They all have the adjustable saddle, either ceramic or rosewood, and they have the three-ply laminated bridge plate under the bridge. Yeah, so the adjustable saddle and the plywood bridge plate, they have a distinctive sound. Um, there's just a lot of barriers in between the vibrations of the string and the soundboard. It's not the most acoustically efficient design, put it that way. It's often kind of a scooped tone, which does tend to behave very well with other instruments in a recording mix, which is part of the reason these got very popular. Uh, I think, personally, they sound better if you get rid of the adjustable feature, but that's not something you would do if you've got one that's vintage and in good shape. I mean, there are ways of doing it which I've shown in other videos, making a tight-fitting, removable plug while retaining the adjustment hardware on the top so you can put it back to original because a lot of people are concerned with that and some people really do like the sound of them unmodified. This one has had a neck reset. The heel fits pretty well. There is some polishing compound residue down in the corner there, white stuff. It's not cocaine. The action here is acceptable-ish. Uh, right now it's a little over 7 64ths on the bass side, 6 on the treble, which is about 110 thousandths, 2.8 millimeters. So it could come down a little bit. The neck relief is in the range of about 14 thousandths at the 6th fret, which again is a little more than I'd usually like to see. So we might adjust the neck a bit. And these again are some fretless wonder frets very wide and very low. Average height is just over half a millimeter, like 20 thousandths of an inch. And they could really use a good cleaning. They're pretty dirty. So the real reason it's here today is after the neck reset, the fingerboard extension, which is this part that rides over the top, was glued right back down again and the drop-off is very noticeable. Sometimes you know, this can cause issues around the neck to body joint because you're putting a pretty big kink into the fretboard there and it can loosen or raise or do other funny stuff to the frets in that area. And the other thing it does is it really draws your eye. You know, you look down at that and all of a sudden you don't feel quite so confident in the guitar. It's a visual distraction. I mean, functionally, nobody plays up here. This is really mostly a cosmetic thing in this case. Well, usually. Sometimes the degree of dip can mean structural issues with the soundboard. With that plywood bridge plate and the reverse belly bridge, there's a lot of forward roll in some of these soundboards. A little bit is almost inevitable. This one does have some dip around the sound hole, but it's not too extreme. Now there is some funny stuff with this guitar. It's missing the label. That's not unheard of. You know, the adhesive wasn't great. It's basically just a sticker and if it was kept in a pretty humid place for a while, sometimes they just roll up and go away. The serial number is stamped up here on the back of the headstock in the usual location. I looked it up and I found 
different conclusions on different sites. It seems like it might be 1963. However, the nut width on this is very puzzling. Um, they supposedly started off at 1 and 11 sixteenths, pretty typical. Then in 1965, they were supposedly reduced in width to 1 and 5 eighths. However, this guy here is thinner than that still. This is a super trim 1 and 9 sixteenths. This is about as narrow a neck as you're going to find. Next up, the pick guard. If this guitar is from 1963, this might not be the original guard? Question mark, question mark. Because they didn't screw them down until later in the decade. This one isn't screwed down, but it has little glass crystal things, almost like fake diamonds, rhinestones or something, that have been put into the screw pockets on this guard and in the bird's eye there. So this might be an elegant way of covering up the unused screw holes in a replacement guard. And there are no screws or holes extending below in the, on the interior of the soundboard, like you might find on some of the later Norland era Gibsons. This thing is, well, dating these guitars by features alone can be really hit and miss, because they weren't always consistent from year to year. And you're basically at the mercy of what others have determined and posted online previously. And so there's often contradictory info out there. You can find real experts who have handled a thousand of them who can probably tell you more than I can. So I am assured that this is from the 1960s. Um, who knows, maybe the guard fell off or turned into a potato chip or cracked or something. And as for the neck, well that's a real puzzle. These are the kinds of things we can't know. At the end of the day, I just have to fix this thing and make it work for the customer. You can see there's some tiny gaps and some glue that's been pushed into the crack that's formed right at the corner here between neck and body. When you're doing a neck reset, that's the kind of thing that often happens. If the body has sort of humped up a little bit, there's usually nothing you can do to prevent that except for fill it. Um, kind of things I'll keep in mind when I'm loosening this portion of the fingerboard though. Before we go any further, I'd like to also try and adjust the truss rod to get that neck a bit straighter so that I'll know the approximate geometry we're going to end up with when we're done here. Um, that'll keep me from perhaps making a wedge that's too tall at the far end. I'm just going to tighten this up a little bit. Yeah, there's plenty of adjustment in there. I suspect that'll be good. Okay, that adjustment has brought us down to about eight thousandths relief, which I think is good, and it still plays cleanly. So, it also brought the action down about half a sixty-fourth. Okay, I got my heater out here. I'm going to use moderate heat, around 250 degrees-ish. Uh, I, because I've got the pick guard right there, I don't want to take that off if I don't have to. This board is bound in celluloid. Neither of these things likes to be exposed to extremes of temperature. Um, so, you know, when this is happening, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to stand here, watch it every second of the way. And uh, it'll probably take the better part of 15 minutes to heat up to the point where I can get my palette knife under it. You know, I've got a piece of plastic here, which sort of helps me uh, when I'm trying to lever under the board a little bit. It just, you know, prevents me from digging into the soundboard. Other than that, it's just a question of time and gentle effort. You know, just let it go at its own pace. Okay, this is a piece of Hollywood. Hooray for it. I'll save you the Ethel Merman impersonation. The reason I like this stuff, um, rather than trying to use plastic to mimic the binding, this is, um, it looks very much like aged plastic. It's sort of an antique white color. It's easy to work and it glues nicely to the underside of the fingerboard and the top of the guitar. That's kind of an important joint. I suppose you could use rosewood, bind it in plastic, and make the wedge out of that. This stuff is just easier on so many levels. You want a good fit between the parts as much as possible, um, which isn't always easy because this thing has been put on and removed, of course, and then removed again. 
There can be, you know, pieces of wood fiber stuck to the fingerboard. There can be cracks in the top. I'm pretty sure, looking at the inside here, that there is at least one open seam down the center. It's nicely supported by the big brace that uh, goes transverse here. But, you know, it can be kind of a wavy, undulating surface that you want to fit to. Um, and trying to keep the top surface of the fingerboard relatively level. Like I was saying, this is an important joint because this surface area here is what's really preventing the neck from sliding forward down in towards the sound hole, which is pretty much the main goal of string tension. It, it wants to fold the guitar up on itself. And uh, without a good glue joint here on a flat top guitar, that becomes a real issue. I've used masking tape and super glue to affix the holly to a plywood riser. This lets me plane an angle that diminishes to zero. It goes off the end of the board there. The blank is slightly oversized in both length and width. For retrofitting this kind of wedge on an old guitar, I tend to cut it into three pieces. Um, this makes it easier to accurately fit. So I'll taper it to the approximate thickness and then I'll leave enough for fine tuning. Because of the undulating nature of this guitar, the wedge here is slightly short of the full length of the fingerboard extension, just the way it ended up. It gets too tight to go full length. The outside pieces are about 6 millimeters wide, as you see, and this lets me get a really good fit on the edges of the board. I'll scrape it to fit, so when installed the board isn't under too much tension or compression, and I won't have to press it down too firmly for the glue up. It mirrors the terrain on the underside of the fretboard. Then the wider middle piece just sort of acts as a filler between the two edges. At that point I just have to add a little glue and everything slides neatly into place. The little bit of extra width can be carefully sliced away, making sure not to cut into the soundboard. Because it's been nicely fit, it doesn't take much pressure to get the extension clamped down. I have a padded call on the inside as well to protect the soundboard. Here's the result. The board now continues in a straight line with just a hair's worth of fall away. And the edges of the binding still have some of this grungy looking stuff on them which I want to clean away as I blend the new material in with the old. I'll gently scrape it and then sand it. I'll apply a little bit of touch up lacquer on the raw wood of the wedge. Then I'll mix in a little bit of amber dye to give me an aging solution and I'll try and take away some of the stark whiteness. This mimics the rest of the severely yellowed lacquer on the rest of the binding. While that cures up a bit I'll tackle the frets. These began life with a very flat kind of profile as Gibson just leveled them and then rubbed over the corners with a sanding block. Time has made them flatter again so I'll try and put some crowning on them. This isn't the easiest job. None of the commercially available fret files can really do this. The ones made for jumbo wire are too tall and they won't make contact. I suppose the Z file could do it if held correctly. I'm of course using the triangular file with the safe corners. Then of course polish up to a shine these have never seen before. That little bit of rounding on the top does make a difference when you're playing. You can feel it. Okay, I put some strings on it and it plays nice and clean all the way up the board until we get to the 15th fret. Which isn't so much of a surprise. I uh, kind of suspected it might. The 15th is the one that would have been taken out and replaced during the neck reset. And it's also the spot where this wedge kind of peters out to nothing. Uh, it's over top of the neck block inside there. Oftentimes it's the one that's going to cause an issue. So grab the fret rocker here. And yep, it does indeed rock on the 15th. These are marvelous little things. Uh, you have to know though that sometimes when you're checking things out and you find the fret that rocks, you say to yourself, well there's the high fret, I should file it right down. Sometimes it's the one that's before or after that is actually too low, you know. So you have to kind of do a little bit of sleuthing around in that area to see which fret is actually high and, if possible, isolate it. Now, 
there is a slight fall away on this extension here. It's about half a millimeter or so. So I would expect that every fret would be a little bit lower along the length of this extension. One of the first things to do is to press on this fret with a piece of hardwood and see whether perhaps it's lifted in its slot and is loose. It helps if you have magnifying glasses on. Uh, you can usually see it go up and down. That does not appear to be the case here. If it was, uh, if it was loose in the slot and you tried to level it, it's kind of an exercise in futility because you can press it down while you're leveling it and it'll pop right back up again, um, giving you a never-ending series of headaches. But it seems to be okay. Um, so it's probably just raised. You might be asking, why isn't he using one of those understring leveler gizmos that guide off four or five frets and make things really flat? The answer is, again, that gentle hill analogy. All of these higher frets are sloping downwards, and the preceding ones are on an uphill swing due to the neck relief. And if I scrub them all down to the same level, I might overshoot, and I'd certainly take more height off than I need to. And with these low, wide frets, there's not much there to spare, right? So this is a way of dealing with these fretless wonders if we're concerned about keeping the original frets. Um, so it's, it's intuition and experience, and I kind of know how much to take off at any one time. And, you know, I can grab the fret rocker. It's nice, but I know that this side is lower anyway, so I don't necessarily have to make them all the same height to get a clean sound. It's just a matter of bringing it to pitch, checking it, keeping it up until it works. So I ended up removing about four to five thousandths off the top of that fret, which is like 0.1 millimeters. With that, it's playing cleanly, and I bet you I can take down the action height just a little bit. Let's see how that plays. Of course, after leveling, I've got to go back and recrown this thing again, which is only half a millimeter tall, remember. Okay, so the action came down to just over 660 fourths on the base side, a little lower on the treble, which is nice, comfortable action. And yeah, I think the wedge is suitable. It's ready to go for another 50 or 60 years. You'll probably need a fret job before then, but otherwise it's in good shape.